Welcome back to Monday, week three of Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. My name is Manny Acutiel. I own a small business in San Francisco called Manny's. It's a physical place. Unfortunately, we had to shut down because of the shelter in place order. But even though the physical place is shut, the work is not over. And so we are bringing uh, civic conversations to you live to your, to your homes or wherever you might be. And um, a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping. If you have a question for Arya Saeed, you can type it into the Q&A box. Excuse me, at any time. This program will be 30 minutes long. Arya and I will speak for 15, 20 minutes, and then there'll be 10 minutes or so of questions. So if you have questions for Arya, you can type it into the Q&A box at any time. You can also tag us at Welcome to Manny's. And the third thing is, I'm going to be, um, I am going to be uh, answering, I'm going to be asking you at the end if you'd like to uh, support Manny's, and there will be a link, a joint link to do that, which I would definitely appreciate. Okay. Arya Saeed, I'm so honored to be talking to you again. I think you're so amazing. I'm so proud to know you, um, and I appreciate the time because I'm sure you've got a lot of shit you're doing right now. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. This so they really got me out of bed today. So yes, yes. Well, that's the goal. <laughs> that's what I'm. Every day I wake up and I think, how can I get Arya out of bed? That's my first. Yes. Goal. <laughs> so mission accomplished. Like I'm done with my day now. I can just go back home because I'm never leaving home. Uh -huh. um, so shelter in place, the, t the title of this conversation is Arya's living room. And we mm -hmm. kind of jokingly decided we'd call it Arya's living room because we thought like, wouldn't it be interesting just to figure out what your living room is like? Cause you just moved, right? Yes, I did. When did you move? Ooh, let's see. I moved five months ago. <laughs> five? I think it's five. It, months ago. it feels like just. Yeah, well, now actually it feels way longer. No, I moved in here October, however many months that is. Okay, uh, like, yeah, sounds like five or six. Mm -hmm. And you live in Oakland, right? Yeah, I live in Oakland. Um, and Temescal specifically. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you know. I know Temescal. Okay. Tell us, tell us about your living room, Maria. Um, okay, well, moving in here was quite um an experience mostly because i was um i i went and spoke um at a thing in atlanta and mm -hmm. um i was staying in an airbnb um specifically a one bedroom airbnb and before for for a few years i lived in a very tiny studio um and so i was like i need space like i absolutely need some space and mm -hmm. that worked really hard I deserve to have a one bedroom or something like I need that in my life um and I'm a big girl and I got tired of bumping into the bed or the chair or the whatever or having clothes stacked up on a basket and you know I just had really outgrown my studio apartment but anyone that knows me knows that I've always lived in tiny apartments um it's just always sort of happened and I guess can I just pause, pause there for a second? How yeah. do you think that the years of living in really, really small spaces affected who you were in that time? How did it, how did it manifest in your, in who Arya was when she lived in those apartments? Um, I think I needed coziness. Um, and I think, yeah, I needed warmth, coziness. Small places really worked for me because I, um, so before doing the work that I do now, um, I was a sex worker and, um, when you lead a sex worker lifestyle and you're traveling and on the go, and then of course your money isn't, you know, you don't get a guaranteed paycheck. I had to move quite a lot. And so one minute I would be doing really well and living in my own apartment in the Tenderloin. Next minute I'd be staying at the, the Civic Center Inn on, on Polk Street for a week and then SRO hopping and then get another apartment. And, and then I'd be staying in hotels and sit in different cities and stuff. And so I think um, small apartments gave me the coziness and the warmth that I, I needed and they really felt like home. And if you don't have a lot of stuff, then it looks very chic. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, it's funny. I asked because 
I do feel like it is such a San Francisco experience to live in small spaces. Mm -hmm. I'm from LA originally. Um, and you know, even if you don't have a ton of money in LA, you can find often like the ability to maybe have a small front yard, right? Like there, that's possible. That's attainable. Maybe a small backyard, you know, and here it's impossible. Like to have your own front yard, no one's got that. To have your own back, your own backyard, forget about it. And so we are so used to like the scale is so different in our city. I just wonder how it affects, I mean, the whole Bay Area. I wonder how it affects the way we move about the world, you know? Well, for me, I also did not like living with roommates, which is a very classic San Francisco thing. So once upon a time, I stayed with nine roommates in the inner sunset. Um, and we stayed in a three bedroom house and four of us were in the living room. Yes. That's too much. <laughs> in fashion school at the time. That's too many um, people in too small a space. I mean, back then it was very chic. You could eat your roommate's food if you were broke. Like, Actually, you know. I, <laughs> that's true. And then they would find out about it. How many bathrooms? It had one bathroom. <gasps> Mm -hmm. So I had to wake up at like five in the morning because my roommate, um, I lived with a gay couple and they would always have sex together in the shower. I hope this is, wait, sorry, do I need to censor that? No, <laughs> you don't have to censor. This is not going on like PBS. It's fine. Okay, cute. Cool. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I lived with roommates, but then I always hated the, like, we need to have a house meeting. And yeah, that just never was for me. And so, I, um, the only place I could afford to live by that point, I had lived in the Sunset, the Bayview, Inner, Richmond, and then I lived in the Tenderloin. Yeah. On Turkey. Now, now you're an executive director, executive yeah. directress, and you're, you, have, you, you have multiple organizations that you run, you've got a national profile, and you have your own spot, you've got your own apartment, and, and I hope, fingers crossed, that the time in your life where your housing was much more unstable is behind you. And you can confidently expect to have this space and be able to invest in this space, not just financially, but like metaphorically and spiritually and all that. And so can you tell me about what that process has been like for you and like how you've gone about decorating it and creating home for yourself? It's already fully decorated. <laughs> So I thought what you said to me a couple weeks ago when we met. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, thank God for a credit card. Yeah. Um, a couple, uh, actually, a few weeks ago, I bought a dresser for the first time as an adult, and I had this moment. I was talking to my friend Brianna, and I was like, you know, oh, actually, Janelle, who works with me at the Transit yeah. Chick, she was like, "Girl, why haven't you ever had a dresser?" And I was like, "Well." When I thought about it, at first it was, I don't know. And then when I thought about it, I realized because I moved around so much and I had housing instability, you know, I've been evicted before, actually twice from San Francisco and um, yeah. had a tumultuous journey with housing while in the Bay. And so for me, it was always like, well, girl, who gonna move that dresser if I have one? <laughs> Like big heavy furniture, who's going to help you move it? And so um, when I bought the dresser, I actually had this moment where I know this sounds corny, but I cried because I was like, wow, something really normal for someone actually was like this big thing for me because I was like, oh, wow, if I buy this dresser, now I got to figure out what, I, how I'm going to move it if I ever get evicted. And then there was... My friend Brianna was like, but girl, you're not going to get evicted. Yeah. But Do you worry? Is there, is there ways in which that, the, res, the kind of trauma from your previous experiences are manifesting in other ways in your home life? Definitely. I mean, um, I think we all have something that sort of triggers that we don't know. Um, and for me, housing uncertainty always made me really apprehensive about settling in mm -hmm. um, and or buying stuff or having too much stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not actually a minimalist, like I'm more of a maximalist, but <laughs> you know, just because of life and the way that it happened, I always had this insecurity. So this apartment is definitely also aesthetically a celebration 
of who I am now and like all the things that I've gotten to do and I've gotten to travel quite a bit around the world yay, um, and do really incredible, incredible things and, and meet people that I've admired since I was in school and a kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so like behind me, I have my Basquiat prints. Um, I got them from the Brooklyn Museum. Um, it like really meant a lot to me. See some Jim Bean there as well. Uh, see some Jim Bean there as well, maybe. No, there is no Jim Bean. I think that is. So that's my wet bar, <laughs> um, and it has different. Like people give me alcohol as gifts, um, and I don't actually drink that much, so mm -hmm. just sit there. And you then said, yeah. yeah, is there? You said that there's objects around you that bring you joy. Is there an object around you within reach that like? that has that's powerful that brings you joy yes so i don't know if you guys can see that gorgeous sculpture moment <laughs> um but it's that vase actually yeah. um so beautiful what yeah so i um it's huge in real life so it's like four and a half feet tall wow. it's super heavy um i got it at z gallery uh the store in San Francisco Union Street was yeah. closing. And um, it's like slightly broken on the bottom, but no one can see it. And so mm -hmm. um, I like haggled with the yeah. sales associate and I got it for 50 bucks. Yeah. And Janelle came with her car and we do it in her car. Um, and yeah. someone else had just bought a vase similar to that. And then as soon as they, they put it in a bag, I don't know why they did it, and then they dropped it and it broke. And so I was like freaking out that it would happen to me. Um, let's see, what else? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna take you around. Here's my kitchen. It's my like- kitchen. Um, And then um, the kitchen and the, the living room are combined. Mm -hmm. and so here- Love that boss. Um, I have another one. Oh. Okay. There we go. That's so it. that is a console table um, made out of sequoia tree. Wow. And um, this guy that I used to date bought me these eternity roses. They last like a year. They're really expensive, but he bought them for me a long time ago. Okay. Um, and they've lasted forever. And then I have... Vogue, so I do subscribe mm -hmm. to Vogue, and then I love this. oh, this lamp. Okay, so <gasps> it's beautiful. Yeah, with the 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 rope. Yes. So uh, it's not a good photo, but basically, um, I was on apartmenttherapy.com um, looking for ideas. And there is a store in the Mission District called Mission Loft. And they sell these, like, it's like eight, maybe 12 feet long rope. Um, and then the bulb is, like, really big. It's, like, the size of a coffee table book. Um, I'm sorry you guys couldn't see it, but I can post a photo later. Mm -hmm. um, but I got it from Mission Loft in the Mission District, and I had seen it on Apartment Therapy. Um, and someone had like five of them. Um, it's not a cheap lamp, so I couldn't afford to have five of them, but it, it worked out. It was really cute. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I just have one or two more questions about your home life. Um, for folks who are tuned in, you can also write your questions in for Aria, either about her living room or her work uh, or writing. I, mean, I see her question. Um, but if there are questions, you can type them in now uh, for Aria. Um, I want to ask you about the future, not of, of transgender district. I mean, I have a question to you about that, but I want to ask you, like, if, if you close your eyes and you think about what your home looks like in 10 years, in 10 years, mm -hmm. so um, I'm not going to ask your age, but imagine 10 years from today. I'm 30. What? I'm 30. Yeah, okay. You said it. So we're the same age. So when we're 40, what do you want your home to look and feel like? And, and kind of what do you want to, what, when you walk into your home, what impression do you want to get? Mm. Well, context, I would definitely want to live near water at 40 
well, I want to live by water now, but um, it would have to have floor to ceiling windows. Um, I love sunlight. I, I love to have my windows open. I love air and curtains billowing. Like I'm very much that person. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, the theme of my life, at least for the last couple years, my home life, I really love luxury. But when I say luxury, I don't mean like a label. I mean things that make me feel comfort that you don't have to really, like, that, that you don't have to really buy. I don't know if that makes sense. But I like, I love a really soft bed. Um, you know, I'm someone that loves to sleep. Um, I do my best thinking when I'm asleep um, or in the shower. Mm -hmm. um, I love aromatherapy. I have candles burning constantly. Oh, amazing. Um, and yeah, it just has to be soft and definitely a place that warrants um relaxing and 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 thinking um mm -hmm. because i do a lot of my we have an office and all that kind of stuff but i do a lot of the visioning and strategy for my work at home you know the the thank you for answering that question it's such a, i think it's, a, it's an exercise that we don't really get to do i mean i just feel fortunate to have a place to live exactly in the bay that i mean it's an, an exercise in like, what would an, an ideal living situation feel like? Like we don't allow ourselves that kind of like imagination. And I mean, it's a sad, it's a sad fact of our current Bay Area where there are so many people who are either, excuse me, unhoused or on the verge of being unhoused or housed, but they're spending so much money on housing that they're like barely keeping it together. I know right. when I first moved here, I lived in an, a third floor apartment with seven people, so not nine, in one bathroom. And in one of the bedrooms was a mother, father, and a three-year-old. And it was just like oh, uh, a lot of people. And I was just, and I, my room, I, it was $600 a month. And it was small, so small that like I had to like go up a ladder to go to the bed. And then my like living area was underneath the bed. Like a loft. It was like a loft, but loft would be like too nice to... <laughs> And like, you know, back then, if you would have told me, you know, five years from now, you'd have your own apartment. It's small, but I have my own apartment too. I wouldn't have believed you. I'd have been like, that's impossible. Right. And, you know, it's just, I think it's important to, to try to get out of the scarcity, scarcity mindset a little bit, because I feel like people that do the work that we do, we don't really allow ourselves to do that so much. And it's important. Someone, someone told me actually, um, before I moved into this apartment, I remember feeling really guilty um, for even contemplating living in this apartment. And it was a black queer man um, and his sister is a black trans woman that I know. And we were talking and she was like, as long as you do incredible work for your community and as long as you give back, you owe no one an explanation for how you choose to live. And that always stuck with me. Um, yeah, I wonder how long I'll be able to live in my own apartment, to be quite honest, um, given the uncertainty of COVID. Um, and I do pay half my salary to live here. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's not exactly affordable for me. Yeah. Um, which is why I do other, like I do speaking engagements and consulting and all that kind of stuff, usually to sort of supplement my mm -hmm. primary income. But I am in this moment really grateful. Um, and when I wake up in this apartment, um, it has inspired some of the work that we've done um, for trans folks who I know are definitely more vulnerable to losing housing, especially if you're in the SROs yeah. um, in, in, in the Tenderloin or in Oakland. Like, mm -hmm. And so it has inspired some of the stuff that we're trying to do right now with addressing COVID-19 and ensuring trans people have um, a bit more agency in determining where they can shelter in place. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So, my, my only, um, thank you for giving us a tour of your home life and your living room and telling us about the concept of home and what it's meant to you. I only really have, uh, there's a couple questions, but I want to get, my question to you is uh, just, I wanted to ask about the name change from Compton's 
uh, cafeteria, Compton's Transgender Cultural District to the Transgender Cultural District. What precipitated that? Um, it's something that we, um, so when I say we, um, there are two other co-founders, um, myself, Honey Mahogany, um, who is a legislative aide to Supervisor Matt Haney right now, um, and a co-owner of the stud, and then Janetta Johnson, who is the uh, executive director of Transgender Gender Variant Intersex Justice Project um, in SOMA. And we um, had been aware of the name and what it meant when we created the name, to be quite honest. Um, but our focus at that time was sort of um, cultural heritage preservation work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, determining that we did in fact have a substantial um, history in the neighborhood to become a legally recognized cultural right. district. Um, and so that was something that we were slightly aware of, but it, it didn't really matter. We were promoting Compton's Cafeteria Riot and that legacy and, and just the legacy of the Timberline being um, having one of the densest populations of trans people living in the neighborhood than any other neighborhood in, in the country, um, and definitely San Francisco. And so we thought of other names, but I don't think we really determined an actual name. Um, and so when we did things like with the website and the Instagram and we just said transgender district, it was actually really sort of informed by other trans people, especially trans people in the neighborhood, being like, oh yeah, the trans district is over there. Like, and so we're like, oh, the trans district. Um, but we didn't change it formally or anything like that. We just sort of noticed that informally people were referring it to that. Um, and then when we were doing media, uh, two things were coming up. One was Compton's and so, there are LGBT groups in LA that are like, oh my God, Compton's has a transgender district. <laughs> and we're like, uh, no. No, baby. I Definitely mean, we does did, not. <laughs> Definitely we, does not. <laughs> we did start a cultural district in the hood, but not in Compton. But not in Compton. No. Not in Compton. So, um, next stop. Next stop. That was something that happened. And then, uh, we were doing, um, I was doing an interview with the Daily Mail in the UK and the journalist was uh, doing some deep digging on Jean Compton um, and had remarked that it was interesting that one of the world's most visible transgender projects um, is actually named after a white cis man who was transphobic and the huge reason trans people were marginalized in this particular way was because him and his staff would call the police on trans people and queer people and drag queens. Right, right. And so that always sort of stuck with me. Um, yeah. And it always made me uncomfortable. And so when I went to Brazil, um, I had to talk about the history of the district and talking about it to that particular audience where there is an ever presence of trans people um, especially in Rio and Sao Paulo. Yeah. Um, and it just made me even more uncomfortable. And so um, the Transgender District team, our squad, um, me, Sean, and Janelle, we were talking and um, as a team, we just were like, let's just be the Transgender District. Um, and I was like, oh, that's really cute. It's iconic. So. I love it. Um, so yeah, yeah that's what it, that, that's yeah. what inspired it. Thank you for sharing that story. We have time for two questions, it looks like. The first is Diamond Styles wants us, would like to know, uh, would like you to tell us about your dream home's color palette. Mm. Um, um, we know that it's a ton of negative in. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. My dream home color palette. Um, right no now. Answer, you can answer Diamond's second question about the negative. The, yeah. The Right now, it is, these are chinchilla um, fur pillows. Ooh. Um, and they're seafoam green. So my furniture is all white. And then, um, so my couch is white. I have an ottoman that's white. Um, and then the accent colors, I have seafoam green. My bedding is seafoam green to tie it all 
together and then um silver um silver accents so like the uh the legs of my couch are silver the uh console table that y'all saw is silver um uh, diamond and i actually share the same entertainment tv set situation from <laughs> we were joking about that um i plan on getting rid of it soon because uh, it just diamond, doesn't go diamond know that huh diamond knows that yeah okay. um that we have uh she it, it's corny I, I know diamond very well that joke. it's a friend joke thing okay yeah. uh, uh but seafoam green and white um and blush those mm -hmm. are my favorite colors um and i love to have those at home especially you might appreciate this right behind me i got these prints made of these Mughal Empire, um, like Rajasthani princes. Yes. What I love about them is they're like kind of like drag queens a little bit. Like, do you see mm -hmm. like pearls? Right. Dressing. With the beading and all. Honey. The beading. Yeah. Eyebrows. Yeah. Those eyebrows. Where did you get these? You had them made. I had, well, I bought the prints online and then I had them framed. Yeah. Yeah. But like my father's from Afghanistan, so it's kind of like a play on mm -hmm. my family, but like, yeah. Anyway, um, Sarah has a question. Uh, Sarah would love to support people trying to access gender dysphoria treatment during this pandemic, especially because Sarah knows it's already difficult to access without, sh without shelter in place. Do you know of ways in which she, I assume she can support this, especially in the Bay Area? Ooh, so gender dysphoria treatment, like hormone replacement therapy or mental health. Anyway, okay, so um, I think Trans Thrive um, has maintained, um, they're at, I would say API Wellness, sorry, they changed their name, San Francisco Community House, um, on uh, Polk and Ellis Street, 730 Polk. I believe that they are continuing um, gender health services mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, I know that St. James Infirmary, also located at 730 Polk, um, is providing mental health services. And um, I believe they're still running their transgender clinic on Thursdays. Um, and then they have an outreach van where they're giving out um, supplies and what have you um, uh, late night. And so those are the two projects that I know um, are still doing um, health services and and right now, um, St. James Infirmary is is enrolling um, participants for their mental health program, and I think Transive is doing online support groups through Zoom right now. So normally they would be in person, and then the Oakland LGBT Center has been doing some programming. Um, I know they have a, a trans support group. Um, and those staff would be able to link people to the appropriate care. Are you hearing about instances of COVID-19 positivity um, or transmission in the transgender district? Kind of, I interviewed Del Seymour and he talked a little bit about the TL and then Matt Haney as well, but like, what are you hearing from folks on the ground? I am not hearing that, um, to be quite honest. Um, you know, I realize that COVID-19 is something that we're dealing with and I don't know if I get to actually see, I haven't seen anyone in a hospital gown running around. So mm -hmm. um, it's a good sign that the curve is flattening. However, I'm hearing more about trans people in the Tenderloin and beyond, um, thinking that they might have symptoms, not feeling that they're able to go get the COVID test. Mm -hmm. um or being really apprehensive about pursuing it yeah um and then um of course sort of with the shelter in place mandate uh wherever and whoever you are it's really affected obviously everyone's lives right. um and so for a lot of trans people in the tenderloin um you know not being able to go out uh to make money uh however you make your money has obviously been very difficult and then if you've been marginally housed, there's not a lot of resources at the moment. I know that the, some people are being housed in hotels um, and three meals a day and what have you, but a lot of people are being asked to call 311 or being routed to the shelters. 
Yeah. And then, of course, we've been seeing in the media that the shelters have been having coronavirus outbreak. So right. um, I personally haven't heard from community members as to whether they're contracting corona. Yeah. Um, however, I am hearing from people who um, feel like they have coronavirus symptoms, but don't feel inclined to go to the hospital. Yeah, okay. Um, I can I ask one more, one more quick question, which is about queer spaces in the transgender district and the TL broadly. I mean, there's so few left, right? There's just like Aunt Charlie's Lounge and the Cinch, and mm -hmm. I guess Aunt Charlie's Lounge and the Cinch. Yeah. Am I missing one? Um, there is queer social spaces. Wait, there's a name. Wait, maybe that is the Cinch. Um, mm -hmm. No, that's not in the district. Being, I know it's not, but it's like district of Jason. Oh God, I wear a Sean when I need him. There yeah. is a queer bar. It's right next door to Glamorama um, Salon. Um, in the Tenderloin. Huh? Uh -huh. On Taylor Street, so on Turk and Taylor, um, there is a tiny little bar. It's actually uh, owned, co-owned by a trans man. Um, uh -huh and they've been having pop-up parties. Um, and then, of course, Aunt Charlie's. Yeah, um, I guess my question is, are you worried about the very, very few queer spaces left in the district and around the district not reopening? Yes, I mean, so Aunt Charlie's is one because Aunt Charlie's is, they don't own their building. So they have already been very yeah. vulnerable to closing like so many other queer bars. Yeah. Um, that so that is box. one. And a lot of trans people perform at Aunt Charlie's yeah. as box girls, and that is their income. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I know people are doing drag Zoom parties and stuff, but not a lot of, there's a lot of trans people who also don't have access to a smartphone or a consistent phone line, right. et cetera. And so yeah. that is one fear that I have. And then another is like Glamorama Salon, um, you know, they just posted that um, they may be ineligible for the small business loans um, and vulnerable to having to close. And so they do currently have a GoFundMe um, asking folks to support. Um, and if you want, instead of, if you can't donate, but you want to buy like hair care products, mm -hmm. they'll work with you on that. Um, but they're co-owned by trans folks um, and they've been super supportive of the community. You know, we were supposed to, in May, do like free haircuts for trans folks um, and stuff like that. So it's really scary. I mean, also, uh, my team hates when I say this publicly, but the trans district may close in June. Um, and I have not formally that? That? announced that because- What does that mean? the majority of our funding comes from the city of San Francisco. A lot of our funding is potentially set to be cut um, because money will be rerouted towards COVID-19 uh, relief for businesses and hotels and banks and all that kind of stuff. Um, and of course the city is paying, I'm sure tons of money to be housing people and it comes from somewhere. And so, um, you know, we, I hate saying this publicly because it's all uncertain, but we don't know if we'll be open. We're applying for a loan, just like many other small businesses, to see if we can stay open as a nonprofit. Well, that, um, can, that can happen. What do you mean? You can't not open, stay open. <laughs> I mean, it's a very real possibility, um, especially because we don't receive a lot of funding. Um, you know, well, we're going to have to make it possible. Yes, we are. We're just going to have to do it together. Know, we're yeah. pulling cats out of the hat and all that stuff. Um, but it's, you know, I will say this. I will say that because we're not, you know, we're not a super large project. I think because we have the visibility that we do, it's assumed that we are just bankrolling. <laughs> and we're not. We're, you know, we're definitely like, at the 500k for a nonprofit, which you know after you pay rent and salaries and all that kind of stuff doesn't go far but we make sure that we put on events and create spaces for trans folks that we do things like the visual storytelling project and when COVID-19 happened it was like we already had heard whispers that we may lose the majority of our funding right 
So our team, Sean and Janelle and myself, were like, well, we need to do something about COVID-19 and we need to give cash to trans folks in yeah. their hands so that they can get groceries. And because we're so small and because we were like, oh, we might close and let's power through till the end and we'll figure it out and, you know, what have you, we were able to give out almost 20K in wow. cash relief. Um, and I think, uh, but well, thank you. Um, and I think um, that is what makes us a different nonprofit project is we don't have millions of dollars in the bank or disposal. You know what I mean? Like we don't have access to those resources. And right. because we're black trans led, it makes it three times as hard to fundraise um, because we're not trusted in the same way that white ran institutions are but what what is for us is for us and like the city has seen what we've been able to do with just the resources on our end and so now the research uh the city just let me know this morning that they're gonna support us um i don't know if i'm supposed to announce that but they're gonna support us with a lot of funding to give out to community for covid relief for shelter in place. So we're gonna be able to help people pay their rent. Um, even though there's a moratorium on evictions, that doesn't mean that people get a month free, yeah. right? There's a misunderstanding with that. The, yeah. the city can only legally say that we're not gonna process evictions. That doesn't mean that landlords are gonna be like, okay, here's the back rent you owe. And, yeah. and so we wanna make sure that people are main, maintain their housing in the Tenderloin and beyond um anywhere in the city and um be able to still get groceries and stuff we're getting tons of letters from trans folks who are losing their jobs at coffee shops who right. are waiting for unemployment and unemployment's not answering the phone like yeah. and we want to make sure you know everyone's waiting around for a stimulus check that may or may not come within the next 90 days and so we just want to make sure that we're supporting yeah. Um, our community because trans people are most impacted yeah. by these types of instances in, in human life um, as we all are and it's not denying that we all are absolutely impacted by our first real pandemic um, in recent memory. Well Aria, I want to thank you so much. For the folks who've tuned in, if you go to the answered section for the Q&A, there are two links to click on. One, there's the Transgender District Donate button. So do click on that and make a donation today to make sure that the Transgender District sticks around. Uh, we gotta make sure it sticks around. And two, if you'd like to support my small business, there's a link, it's joinit.org slash o slash mannies. That link is also above my head right now. So if you want to, if you're wondering like, oh, I wanna support Manny's, I wanna make sure that it also stays open, that it can reopen. You can go to joinit.org slash o slash mannies, make a one-time donation, or even better, become a sponsor of mannies. It's $36 a month, and that's, that's how we are able to stick around, and we need that, that support as well. So make two donations, please, if you're able. One to mannies, one to the Transgender District. I'd like to thank my team over here, Jupiter, Sam, and Ram, for um, powering this conversation and for sticking with me and for being so awesome. And, more, and, I'd like to, and if you want to tag us, you can tag us at Welcome to Mannies. And more than anything, I want to thank Arya Saeed for being a good friend, an inspiration, and for taking us into her living room. Thank you, Arya. Thank you. Bye, y'all. Bye.